The following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit W2Mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment. The W2M Network proudly welcomes you back into the kickoff. Week 3, good evening, or afternoon, if you're listening to us on demand. My name is Harry Broadhurst, coming to you live on the W2M Network studios. Joining me, as per usual, my co-host, Brandon Bisca Bing. Hey, hey, hey. And filling in for the otherwise preoccupied Oreo-hating Stephen Err, is our traditional producer, Eric Watkins. I raise a cinnamon bun Oreo to you, Stephen. <laughs> and I a double stuffed. <laughs> I would also like to give a quick shout out to our man behind the ones and twos this evening. That would be the figurehead, both literally and figuratively, of the W2M Network, Mr. Sean Garmer. Okay, who well, apparently hit, the cat has got his tongue, but that's cool. <laughs> All right. I was on mute, apparently, when I said that, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> Dumbass. He muted himself and forgot to take it off. I, I've done no, that No, I have it muted on uh, on my microphone and on speaker, just in case there's an accident where I hit the button the wrong way. And I forgot that I had it muted on both. And I unmuted my microphone, and then I, I was like, oh, it's still muted on speaker. Great. <laughs> <laughs> The perils of live recording, everybody. What can I say? Gentlemen, it is time to get this show started. Let's go to Studs and Duds. All right, Mr. Producer Man, since you're filling in for Steven this week, we're going to go and let you go first. Who's your stud from week two of college and week one of the NFL? My stud? I I, got to hand it to him. Monday Night Football, rising fantasy stock before the season, not a really traditionally potent offense in recent years. My stud, Adam Thielen, Minnesota Vikings. I mean, credit the Vikings offense for not going dink and dunk, and credit to Thielen for catching it and telling those corners, hey, get out my way. <laughs> See, I, if if I were picking somebody from Minnesota to go with a stud from their performance on Monday night, I think I might go Stephon Diggs. Mm, true, but paying homage to Randy Moss, you have the advantage, but you kind of expect a really breakout performance from him. Season opening franchise records aside, that's only like a level above what you would really expect. But for Thielen, it was like three levels above with what he did. Also, I would give credit I would give credit to Stefan Diggs for that punt as well after his his, his second score. <laughs> hey, he's if got they, some legs. If if they ever need somebody to fill in in case the punter gets hurt, they have a guy. Brandon, <laughs> who's your stud for week two? My stud for week, well, for week one of the NFL is Alex Smith. He had 368 yards, four passing touchdowns against a Patriots defense that was highly touted going into the season and no one expected that upset that we got on Thursday Night Football to start off the season with the Chiefs going into Foxborough and winning 42-27. Yeah, not only going into Foxborough and winning, but hanging a 40 biscuit in Foxborough as well. Yeah, Alex Smith had an outstanding game, and you got to give him the stud this week. I'm really curious as to when the last time a visiting team hung 40 in Foxborough. It's, oh, that's like, been I'm, a while. Well, that, they broke the record. I think um, I remember on the broadcast they said something like um, New England hasn't lost at Foxborough when leading at the half uh, in I don't, a, a while. I think I saw a stat. I think I know one of the stats you're referring to. Wasn't it something along the lines of Brady was like 105 and 0 when leading going into the fourth quarter? Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. That, that was the exact stat. And then 
they didn't proceed because they were up 27 24 going into the fourth if memory serves yes but all right for me i'm gonna kind of cop out here i don't have a stud i have studs and that will be that los angeles rams defense and if you had the opportunity, if you're looking around on Facebook, you'll see the meme here that's been making the rounds, and it kind of says everything you need to know. The Rams' defense outscored seven different NFL teams on Sunday. <laughs> oh, that meme made me laugh so hard because it's so epically true. It, it, the, how, the, how? One time, the one time that I wish I had anybody from the Rams in fantasy. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> yeah, you know what the Rams are wishing they had right now? People. We'll talk about that a little bit later. <laughs> Honorable mention to Stud as well, to Baker Mayfield, a man who was brought up on this particular show last week. After Ohio State came into Norman last year and handed it to the Sooners, Mayfield decided to go into Columbus this past weekend and return the favor. Yeah, that's definitely a big stud right there. Well, I, I know we'll talk about that one later, too. All right, gentlemen, what about your duds? Brandon, I'm going to let you go first here. Who's your dud for week two slash one of the NFL season? My my, my dud, and yes, the the Saints aren't exactly known for their running capacity, but when you have a man like Adrian Peterson on your team, how in God's name, does he only get 18 yards? And he tied with Alvin Kamara for most rushing yards for the Saints this week. Yeah, I mean, we saw it on Monday night. He was not happy with Sean Payton. You saw it on the sideline throughout uh, throughout the game. And if this continues, the Saints are going to have a long year ahead of them. Wait, 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 wait. Did you just say 18 yards led the team in rushing in that game? Yes. Mm-hmm. And to think a couple of us actually picked New Orleans last week on this show. I'll be the first to admit that was that was a bad call on my part. I figured I, that they would be smarter with Adrian Peterson, but I was proved wrong. I also picked New Orleans to win that game. Steven picked Minnesota as his upset pick. I don't think it was an upset for Minnesota to win, but they definitely handled New Orleans. Yeah. Eric, who's your dud for week one slash two? Now, I'm like you. It, it's a little bit of a cop-out, but I've got to preface this by saying I am not knocking Clemson's defense. I'm not. But my duds, the Auburn offense. I mean, granted, we had multiple discussions, especially off-air, about the SEC and where they are on the college football totem pole. But you're a top 15 team. Yes, I know you're going on the road. But for everybody that's saying you could really make noise in the very tough yet top-heavy SEC West, and maybe force another Iron Bowl decider, you don't go to Clemson and rack up 119 yards of total offense. You're better than that. Now, I wrote in our top 25 blurb, this is another big win for Clemson. They've proven now they can win ugly, so watch out. But, oh. In that battle of the Tigers, Auburn, you're better than that. You're well, better what's, than that. What, what's funny about that is we were all talking about on the show last week how Auburn, depending upon how they did against Clemson and moving forward, they could be a legitimate contender uh, or a legitimate uh, threat to Alabama at the top of the SEC. And now mm-hmm. eh, I'm not so sure about that. No. Mm-mm. Well, definitely not if they play against the teams in the SEC West like they did against Clemson. No, Oof. that's because I don't think there's asking for brutality. I don't think there's any question. Much like the Big Ten East in the superior division over there, the SEC West is by far the better division in the SEC. Well, and I say this, and I say this as a Florida fan. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, you're coming up there. McIlwain's doing a good job, but I mean, you got Saban and Alabama. Ah, it's really tough to dispute. Alabama, Texas A&M was supposed to have been something special and looked the part for the better part of three quarters against UCLA. Uh, Old Miss, Auburn, Old, Old Miss, and Mississippi State, who had one of the weirdest plays in college football history. Again, <laughs> discussion, discussion to come. Um, my my dud is not based on numbers because statistically he actually had a pretty good game. My dud is based on the eye test. Guys, correct me if I'm wrong. For the first time in a long time, Tom Brady looked old on Thursday night. Yeah, yeah. He not I mean, in the pocket, lost a step. Oof. I mean, to he be looked, fair, they did still score a good amount of points, so I'm not, it's not like... Yeah, I'm not saying that the, he had a bad statistical performance, but at the same time, there were definitely times where you could see that I don't know if you want to consider it Madden Curse. I don't know if you want to consider it Chiefs defense. I don't know if you want to consider it father time. But however you look at it, Tom Brady did not look like the Tom Brady that led the Patriots to the Super Bowl last year. I'll agree with that. I think I think it's a little too early to really be saying one way or another that Tom Brady is starting to get towards the end of his rope. But it's definitely something to look at moving forward in the season. Well, as as much as we may as much as New England fans may like to think he's not getting towards the end of his rope, let's be honest here. Father time's not on Brady's side. He is forty. Oh, no, of course not. Yeah, and even though he said, Oh, I wanna play until I'm forty five, I mean, come on. You're not Steve DeBerg, you're not George Bland. It's no. No, you can't make it that far. Not in this league. Not now. Yeah, and especially now with the NFL being so much more physical these days than it was back then. Mm hmm. It's definitely, that's going to be one of the bigger storylines moving forward this season is how's Brady doing and how long will it be before we know that this could very well be his last year? So I ask you guys this then, um, with the Battle of the Ageless Wonders happening this weekend here, who do you give the advantage to, Brady or Breeze? <sighs> with the with the way both teams played this past week, even with Brady getting up there in age, you got to go with Brady. I mean, look at what happened this week with with the Saints. I just, the Saints have a lot of things that they have to fix. Uh, and I don't know if they can do it in a week. I mean, I, I got to agree. Brady knows the kind of weapons and talent that he has, and really, you can't bet against a Bill Belichick system. I said it before, I've seen this movie with the Chiefs getting a big win against the Patriots early in the season. What happened? Patriots go on to the Super Bowl. So, there's a couple minor tweaks, but I'm sorry. Brady just has still a little bit better, but more around him. So, he gets my nod. Um, I don't know if I'll get to say this again this season, so I'm just going to go ahead and say it right now. The Buffalo Bills lead the AFC East. <laughs> it's only week one, damn it! But I'm gonna take this horse as far as I can ride it. Hey, enjoy it, 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 that exactly. first place while you can. <laughs> they, they really well. They probably would have lost anyway, so never mind. I was gonna say the only reason why they're in sole possession of first place is because the Dolphins didn't play this week. But um, I would have picked Tampa the- Bay in that game. Yeah, so would I. <laughs> I mean, it is what it is. All right, gentlemen, so let's go ahead and move into our So That Happened Here. And since you brought up the Miami-Tampa Bay game, it appears that the hurricanes that we've been having are still wreaking havoc on college football, if not necessarily the NFL. Uh, Eric, this directly affects you as a Miami of Florida fan. The game against Florida State, supposed to be the Saturday night main eventer, has been postponed until October 7th. 
Yeah, I'm kind of saddened by this because Florida State is good and vulnerable now. And it's been quite some time since I've experienced a good amount of joy in beating them. But now they have time to get settled and maybe get established. And come October 7th, they not as scary as I would have thought going into this season. But eh, they could still rattle me a little bit. Yeah, I mean this this game it's going to change a lot in in both teams uh season. So it'll be interesting to see how that impacts the season overall. It definitely does Miami of Florida a disservice though by giving Florida State the opportunity to gel with their I believe redshirt freshman quarterback. Yeah. Mhm. As opposed to what it would have been like had they faced Florida State immediately after losing DeAndre Francois. Yeah, I would have potentially pick that as an upset if if they had played. I that don't last think. Week. I I don't think that would be. I don't think that would be considered an upset right now. I think Miami would have to be favored in that game. Yeah, and especially the fact that not just right after losing Francois, but with Miami coming off of a suddenly open date, thanks to the cancellation of their game against Arkansas State. That gives a whole extra week to prepare. And, oh, the gloriousness. Well, I mean, teams that have been affected by this, I, I was telling you guys in the football chat that we have for the Facebook, uh, the Wrestling to the Max football chat, uh, by all means, by the way, if you get a chance, if you follow us on the Wrestling to the Max page, if you're interested in joining the Facebook chat, let us know and we'll add you to the Facebook chat so that way you can – have more conversation about football with us in addition to what you get on air here with the kickoff as well as football to the max. But there are 19 teams right now that are currently winless in Division One in Division One A FBS football. Florida State is one of them, and unfortunately for me, my Florida Gators are another. Well, I but think, I think a lot of yeah, a lot of that a lot is. of that has. To, I'm just going to say a lot of that has to do with the fact that both Florida and Florida State had cupcake games canceled this past Saturday by Hurricane Irma. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I think a lot of the teams that are still winless are teams that were affected by Irma. Uh, there's one that wasn't affected by Irma, but we'll get to them a little bit later on in the show. Because <laughs> there's a certain there's a certain team in college football that needs to get it together. <laughs> All right. Um, Eric. Yeah, yes. Third and gold. Now, normally from the, the Louis- third... From the Louisiana Tech 7. Yeah. Normally Louisiana if Tech has the ball. <laughs> yes. Now, normally if you're in a third and goal situation... You pretty much have a near open playbook because you know you have to get two, three, five yards, typically no more than that. But um, when you're facing a third and 93, it's like I don't think there's a play anybody can draw up to kind of convert that. Uh, poor Louisiana Tech, but... Mississippi State, to their credit, and the defender later came out and said, on this play, I'm either going to recover the football or make it pretty much impossible for them to convert by just kicking it repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. The latter happened. (laughs) I mean, thankfully, they got about, oh, 20-some yards of that back on a simple little draw play, so it was wound up being like fourth and seventy. It, it may be the first. I think that's go ahead, first, Brandon. I, I think that's the first time we have ever seen a punt on a fourth <laughs> and goal. Yes. <laughs> Brandon just literally took verbatim what I was about to say. <laughs> I figured. I have never seen anybody punt on fourth and gold before. <laughs> That's a new one. <laughs> I mean, it's like, what can you do? It's like, um, 
Wait, we're yeah. All right, punting team. Just, just no, no. It, what, what's the use of trying like an eighty-yard field goal with that <laughs> instinct? I mean, that's almost. I mean, it's even worse in terms of yardage. But I mean, it would have been crazy if they had done something with it. It would have reminded me of back in what was it, uh, two thousand eight or two thousand nine, the Packers having that 4th and 24 in the playoffs and converting it? 4th and 26. I fourth remember and that one. Yes. <laughs> Just, I, I, also, I thought kicking the ball was illegal. Apparently not. Uh, not if you're a defender. If you're on offense, then that's one thing, because you're worrying about like onside kicks and stuff. I, I literally again, had. Go ahead, Eric. No, I was just going to say. Then again, it's Mississippi State and Louisiana Tech. So by that point, it's like, eh, what are you going to do? <laughs> I, I literally had no words to describe what I had just witnessed watching the video on ESPN.com. <laughs> Much the same way that we kind of talked about before we went on air here. Eric pretty much summed it up best. Now I've seen it all. <laughs> well, yeah, when you've seen someone punt on a fourth and goal, now you've seen it all. <laughs> all right, we move on and we continue our conversation here. And so that happened with so they didn't show up. <laughs> Welcome back to Los Angeles, NFL. Your stadium's like a third of the way full. Pictures have come out detailing the crowd in attendance at the Los Angeles Rams Indianapolis Colts game. And, well, the match was literally seen by dozens and dozens. I, I mean, we're, we're on the 30th anniversary here of the 87 strike and replacement games. And they've been showing some footage and highlights of the Giants and Niners that was played in front of a roaring crowd of tens. I didn't think I would see attendances anywhere near that low again, but yeah, I, wow, I am um, kind of disappointed. Well, and, first thing, first of all, I do want to point out that the, that USC just sold out their first game in the Coliseum in four years with Texas. So it's not just the Rams. It's pretty much anybody that plays there. And it also has to do with who is playing against that team. That plays there. But, I, I mean, you would think that I was going to say, I was just going to say, uh, Eric brought up the replacements, and the very first thought that I had is maybe the Colts could shine, sign Shane Falco to play quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. it, it would be nice to see some of those cheerleaders on the sidelines, but that's for another show. That's an but, I mean, I mean, they didn't know that. Well, actually, I take that back. They didn't know by the time but you would think that fans i just don't know i don't know what what's wrong what do you guys think is wrong with like i did it's the rams they traditionally suck don't get me wrong they've sucked since well kurt warner left more or less Mm -hmm. but this is the first time you've had a national football league game in your city since i want to say the raiders went back to oakland well they were there last year how do you not show up for this game? Well, I, I, you make an interesting point, Harry. During the 80s and mid-90s, when both the Rams and Raiders were in L.A., L.A. Coliseum in L.A. County, that became a Raider town because the Rams actually played farther south than Anaheim. So Orange County became really Ram territory. So... L.A. County hasn't really embraced the Rams since, I would say, the 70s. So maybe that's still a part of it. Maybe you have this whole generation of fans that knew the Rams purely from St. Louis. And towards the end, they didn't show up there either. So maybe they've got to kind of rebuild from scratch in that aspect. So here's my question. What's going to happen this week when both Los Angeles teams are at home? Are we going to see this kind of attendance in both stadiums? 
Well, you kind of have to for the Chargers because they play at the Stubhub Center, well, home to Major League Soccer's uh, LA Galaxy. So, yeah, even if you sell out, that's still only like 30 some thousand. That's still not bad, though. Which no, I guarantee you will probably be more than in the LA Memorial Coliseum. Agreed. Well, but again, we're talking it. about an LA Memorial Coliseum that was that's like what holds like eighty thousand people, ninety thousand people. I, yeah, I mean, come on, WrestleMania couldn't sell at the place, so <laughs> that tells y'all you, you need to know. I this mean, is not a wrestling show, Sean. You're not helping. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we can make wrestling references. It's all right. <laughs> the the Chargers are playing the Dolphins, and that's not going to help them. So that I mean, yes, what you guys are saying is true that it is a smaller stadium, but even there, I don't know if it'll be fully sold out. And the I Rams would... are the Rams are playing the Redskins, so, though. So you would think oh. maybe maybe they get so, at least some fans coming since the Redskins are at least a decent team. Mm. Again. They will be seen by the dozens and dozens in attendance. Yep. I bet you this. But, I mean, they might get really close to sellout when the Cowboys play. I don't know if they play. Yeah. I think actually, never mind. I think the Cowboys play at home against the Rams. But I mean, the the big question here with this, and you had similar questions with other cities with other sports, is how long will it take for them, or or is the NFL so hell-bent on getting the L.A. market now that they just say, we don't care if it's making a huge loss, we're just going to keep it there. Um, how long does it take them to think about relocating again? I think the bigger question to that regard is how long does it take until the owners say, screw this, I'm tired of playing in half-empty stadiums. That's yeah, all. Like it matters. But the other owners would have to. Hold on, it. hold on. They haven't even played in their stadium yet, and we're talking shit here. When they when they yeah. play in their stadium, that's what matters. Whatever they do in the Coliseum I, doesn't matter at all. No, but I don't also, think that'll help. Well, it does I mean, help. With, you don't think people want to go to a new shiny stadium that has all oh, the fixings and, and everything else? Come on. No, Sean has a good point, because I have actually argued vehemently with him about this, but he's right. When the Rams move into their bright, shiny facility in Inglewood, and that also attracts major events away from the Coliseum, that's going to get to a very significant boost. Not to mention, you're not going to have relocation again when, in the span of about three years, you're going to have three teams move. You had the Chargers move to L.A. You had the Rams, now their second season in L.A., back from St. Louis. And in a couple years' time, you're going to have the Raiders move to Vegas. I think that's enough for now. And I think the owners think that's enough for now. I still think an NFL team in Las Vegas is a terrible idea. Yeah, I agree with that. I but agree. that's a con. I disagree. That is a conversation a, for a different myself. show. Once you have a sports team in an different it doesn't matter show. what sport, once you have a you know, once you have an NHL team in there, it doesn't matter. It's all bets off. A conversation for a different NHL episode. <laughs> yes, definitely. Okay. Just because we already have a full schedule for tonight, we'll see if we can't work this discussion in somewhere down the road. I just I don't want to be on the air for an hour and a half getting into a debate that we don't necessarily have time for tonight when we can do it another night. Fair enough, gentlemen? Yep. Fair enough. All right. Is there anything else that we should touch on here in So That Happened? Not that I can think of. No, we pretty much covered it. Actually, you know what? I just remembered the one thing that I was going to say that we were going to talk about a little bit more here. And we're going to roll this right into buy or sell here. Oklahoma going into the horseshoe and knocking down the Buckeyes. Mm. Yeah, one of one of the one of the greatest moments I've had so far this year. It, it that gave me so much delight. Well, speaking as a guy whose team has lost to Ohio State before as well, I sympathize. At the same time, Ohio State stole our coach too. So I was just that. gonna say, not to mention they stole your coach. <laughs> Yeah, I I'm guess great. those are heart problems or whatever were too bad after all, were they? Uh, the heart problem was having to deal with the lack of it in, in Gainesville on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I saw how that team played. Believe me, when they cared, they cared. When they didn't, it was obvious. So that actually kind of rolls us into buy or sell, gentlemen. Are you ready? Yep. Ready. All right, our debate segment here on the kickoff here takes us into buy or sell, where we would either buy the idea that I'm presenting to these two, or they will sell the idea that I'm presenting them to. Simple segment, really, but more complicated once you get into it. Buy or sell. You are more interested in the big attraction college games than you are in the NFL games to start the season. I'm going to sell this only because I'm more of an NFL fan. Um, but I can understand the the appeal to the, the big college games because it does make a difference in, in the playoffs. Um, but... Speaking of the, you know, the Oklahoma Ohio State game, in that regard, you don't really know with what we've talked about with how the Big Twelve is and all of that. I think if Oklahoma runs the table, they're almost guaranteed to get in. But if they lose a game, you're not a hundred percent sure on that. I I know the Big Twelve does have a playoff a playoff now, so it helps. But I'm just, you know. I still think that they've got some more favoritism towards the other power four. Eric, buy or sell, you're more interested in the marquee college football games at the start of this regular season than you are in the NFL games. Honestly, I'm going to buy it because with the NFL, yes, you do have some good game of the week matchups week one, week two. But when I look at the NFL, I'm a guy that's where... I turn it on red zone. I hide my remote for seven hours so I can watch a little bit of everything. I've got a very good taste with preseason. So by week one, I'm ready for a little bit of everything. With college, I don't get that because everybody schedules cupcakes and all these smaller sort of in-state rivalries to where you don't have the ability to have a lot of Big time matchups like you had this season. I mean, Alabama, Florida State with what happened. Oklahoma, Ohio State with Mayfield planting the flag right at midfield at the end, which was awesome. And I don't think he should have apologized for. With how rigid scheduling is and how the fact that you have to schedule non conference games years in advance because you have so few, I'm amped up because Brandon touched on it. You, with the playoff now in place in college football, these early season matchups carry just as much weight, if not even more, than championship week for a lot of these teams. And you have these big matchups setting up other now big time matchups as you progress in the college football season. To Eric, to Eric's point there, and it's kind of piggybacking off of what Brandon said there as well. Um, let's say Oklahoma goes into that Big Ten title game with one loss, and then Ohio State or the Big Twelve title game with one loss. Excuse me, Ohio State goes into the Big Ten title game with one loss. Both teams win their conference championships here. To me, uh, if I had a vote for the college football playoff, and if it were down to Oklahoma and Ohio State, you have to give the advantage to Oklahoma based on their victory. Well, that's. That's obvious, but again, while I would agree that that should be that should be obvious, I'm not 100 percent sure about that. And I'll admit I'm the first one to be a little biased on the negative side against the whole college football system. But I just feel like between the way the system works and and the fact that I feel like they would think that. Ohio State is a bigger draw, I think they would still put Ohio State in above. Didn't we have this problem last year? with? I was just about to bring that up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just about to bring that up, Sean. Penn State defeated Ohio State last year, and I believe in Columbus. Yes. Exactly. My, My point exactly. Well, I would have to say this. It's a bigger draw, and... Yes, you ran into the same problem last year, but you also have to account, even though they are a bigger draw, look at where the two semifinal games are year after year. For Ohio State, yeah, it's not much of a problem because they're a big brand, but really so is Oklahoma. And 
let's face it, Oklahoma, for them to be in a position, like Brandon talked about, getting into the college football play with one loss, if you they have the one loss, but beat a team like Oklahoma State or Kansas State twice, because they would have to, because it's a true round robin in the Big 12, and you have the championship game after that. So you've got to face one of those Big 12 teams twice, beat them twice. I think if you do that, and if that team that they beat is somewhere at least in the top 15 come championship weekend, yeah, I would have to give the nod to Oklahoma. Because I don't think you're going to see that sort of competition that deep in the Big Ten. Not yet. We're going to do our predictions for the college football playoff a little bit later on in the year. It's kind of too early to start making prognostications on a week-to-week basis as far as who's going to go and who isn't. But that will become a recurring segment later on in the year here on the kickoff. All right. Um, By the way, I'm going to agree with Eric here. I'm going to buy this premise and solely for the reason that week week three here in college football – has USC Texas, which is a marquee national matchup, has Florida Tennessee, which is a huge matchup to a lot of fans, specifically in the SEC, but around the country as well. And then there are other games like the Miami Florida State match that was supposed to happen this week that I think would be much more important than any game happening in week two of the NFL's regular season. Absolutely, because here in college football, you pretty much have to win out to give yourself a chance. In the NFL, you could go 10-6 and six and win a Super Bowl. It's really the other, more of how you finish. Yeah, the other thing that I wanted to point out, too, is the marquee game in the NFL is this week is the only one that I'm really interested in in Green Bay and Atlanta on Sunday Night Football. Yeah, and you get that anyways. It's a nice way to end Sunday night and leading to Monday night, so... Lions, I mean, come Lions, on. I think will be, uh, ho- well, hopefully will be good as well. Uh, also, let's be honest here. Houston and Cincinnati is your Thursday night game. Really? Ugh. Well, I mean, why, yes. why is Thursday night NFL football still a thing? Well, really? because they want to get the ratings, but they're, the TV but money. They, they're, TV they're trying money. to make more money. And if they, if they did it properly, if they had good teams playing on Thursday nights, then then it would work. I mean, it, seems, know, like, it seems like every year they put, on week one, they put a good Thursday night game on because they want the Super Bowl champions on the opening night. But then beyond that, it's kind of downhill from there. You know, well, that's, it's kind that of kickoff ironic. game is not really a Thursday night football game. It's just the opener. Right, so uh, I get what you're saying, but it's technically not on Thursday night. He can't help himself but to chime in here and there, can you, Sean? (laughs) No. Uh, Speaking of that Thursday night game, let's go ahead and ask our second question in buy or sell based off of what happened on that Thursday night game, shall we? Your NFL question for the week, gentlemen. Buy or sell, Kansas City made themselves the AFC favorites with their performance against New England on Thursday night. Eric, you go first this time. Sell, sell, sell. Again, they put on a solid performance. Alex Smith had the best game of his NFL career. But I've seen this happen as many times as I want Tom Brady to finally retire and attempt any pathetic revival at modeling Oak Boots. It's not going to happen. You can't get rid of this guy except... And this has happened before, if you aim and his leg mysteriously breaks. That's about it. It's week one. They're shaking out the kinks. So, I mean, I'm still going to say this. The Chiefs aren't even my favorite to win the AFC West. They're not. I I picked Oakland and I stand by that pick. So do I. It's going to be competitive, extremely competitive, but Oakland edges out Kansas City to me. Brandon? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sell this as well, but I'm going to be a little bit more optimistic and say that 
they are definitely the team to watch moving forward to see how they do moving forward this season. And if they get a few more games, a a few more big wins under their belt, if they're able to beat Denver and Oakland, then maybe they are the team to be in the AFC. But the AFC just has too many good teams in it that you have to look at even if new or, or even if new england is starting to lose its luster even if tom brady is starting to go down that road of age there's just too many other teams that you have to look at to really say you know new england I, i'm going to flip this kansas city is not the team to beat yet in the afc but i would say at this point New England is starting to lose that moniker a little bit. They can regain it, but they are not that be-all, end-all. You know, at the beginning of the season, we were all saying it's New England's conference to lose. But now, I think it's a little more balanced. Obviously, New England can reaffirm their position as top dog, but... I think right now you have to be a little bit more wary and look at the AFC a little more wide. Yeah, I I seem to recall talking about the fact in our preview as to whether or not we thought New England was going to go undefeated. Now the question isn't going to be a question of if they lose, it's going to be how many do they lose. And based on their performance, whereas a lot of us thought this might be a 16-0 team or something along those lines there, I'm thinking, based on their performance against Kansas City, 12-4 and four may be more likely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I pencil them in usually about 12 wins, which typically they're fighting for a bye, so that's just that's the Patriot way. All right, so that's going to take us to our third question here for buy or sell. And this is going to be the one that combines both college and the NFL. Buy or sell, there have been entirely too many flags thrown in the first two weeks of the season. I'll I'll buy this. Um, I mean, it's just a symptom. I think it's a symptom of the way both the NFL and college football are starting to try to cut down on injuries and concussions and all of that. But, yeah, I think... I think another part, especially in college, not so much in the NFL, but especially in college, they're too they're too flag happy on those targeting penalties where they'll throw the flag and call it just so that they can review it so that they know whether they made the right call or not. It's like it's like them not blowing the whistle on a on a potential fumble just so that they know they can review it. So I think that I'm gonna buy this, and I think that's a big factor to why. Eric, I, yeah, I'm gonna buy as well. Now, just like we've seen in the NFL, they're taught the referees are now taught don't blow the whistle, call the play, so that way they're more reviewable automatically so you don't have to worry about coaches challenge that's the same thing with college football and the targeting call it and then so you can trigger the review and decide okay does the player need to be ejected so on and so forth and something something that i saw um this past week that i've never seen before which i was happily surprised about is that apparently you can not only not eject the player, but you can overturn your targeting call. I forget mm-hmm. what game it was, in, but I saw that that they Michigan Florida had happened yeah. in week one. No, 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 mm-hmm. this was last week. Well, I was just saying it happened in a Michigan Florida game in week one, where a Michigan oh, okay. player was flagged for targeting and it was overturned completely. Oh, okay. Yeah, I forget what game it was in this week, but I saw it this week as well. So that's a good sign. Yeah, so I I buy it, but at the same time, I'm going to get used to it because the fact that it's starting to become the procedure and protocol 
you're going to see more flags naturally because of that. And I think with the other factors, especially in college, you're finally getting to the point to where players are hitting players from other teams. And you're going and running these plays and things against other teams. Now, as buttoned up as you are in practice, as great as you are in practice, you're still going up against yourselves and each other. Now that you're going up against someone else, well, you've got a whole bunch of different tendencies and things to try to figure out and get that discipline kind of back in place. So I but buy would, it, but oh, go ahead. I would make the argument. I would make the argument that if you're going up against your teammates in practice, you're not going to hit them as hard as you would an opponent. No, yeah. you're not going to hit them as hard as you would an opponent because, again, now you're hitting someone else other than your teammates. And then that really goes all around. When you're going up against your teammates and stuff in practice, everybody kind of knows the timing. Everybody knows the drills because you've gone over and over and over this for weeks and weeks on end. Now that it's against someone else, now you have someone with completely different tendencies who's trying to read yours, you're trying to read theirs. So you're naturally going to get more anywhere from offside, false start, to holding a bit more pass interference to things early on in the season. It's going to go down as time goes on, as it usually does, but I'm saying... uh, it's going on, but it's not really a terribly big deal. Yeah, I, I think I that agree th- with what Eric's saying. I mean, in the beginning of the season, you're going to get more penalties because teams are still getting used to being back on the field and making mistakes early on in the season. That the the flag will start going down as the season progresses. Uh, but I, but you're still going to be expecting uh, more, more flags because of the way the rules are now. Not to mention, and I'm going to buy it as well, but I think it's a lot to do with what Brandon said about officials erring on the side of caution when it comes to protecting players. And I think a lot of that has to do with what we know nowadays about things like uh, P, uh, about uh, PCS as well as CTE post-concussion syndrome as well as the, mm-hmm. uh, the the brain trauma that we know concussions can cause nowadays. And it's an issue that doesn't just affect football. It affects other sports as well, specifically, as Sean mentioned earlier, one of them being professional wrestling. But in regards to uh, in regards to the just sheer amount of head injuries and stuff that have happened over the course of the last couple of years and people being able to play through concussions and playing with concussions, now the protocols have changed to not allow people back on the field when they're in concussion protocol or even when they're inside of that tent now that they have on the NFL sidelines. Yeah, and I mean, I think a lot, I think that also impl- impacts flags because teams have to switch so quickly on the fly. Um, in ways that they didn't have to in the past because they could get their regular players out there. Now they're using substitutes a lot more. Yeah, and the fact that with especially the introduction of new technology for helmets and things and protecting players from that aspect, you are, with all of these new studies about injuries, lifespans, and the big lawsuit that the NFL went through about the retired players, there is so much of an awareness, and the NFL and college are trying to use that awareness and implement things at every possible position, every way they can, to try to reduce these injuries and trauma as much as they can. Maybe not necessarily to reduce the injuries themselves, but to decrease their own liabilities towards it at the very least. Very true. Well, plus you've also I mean, had it is... the, uh, the ticky-tack, like 12-man penalties and all that stuff that gets called a lot more now because of what Brandon said with the substitutions. They have to do so many of them that these get called a lot because, oh, we forgot we have an extra guy in the huddle now. We forgot that we got another guy on the field. I mean, I don't know how many of these 12-man penalties got called just this week so you add that to all the other calls that get called that are normal it feels like there's a zillion flags going on well not not to mention i mean technically it's often been said that you could throw a flag for holding on pretty much every single play 
yep. a lot of it has to do with what is and isn't relevant towards the flow of the game, too. I think that's the big reason that the games are taking three and a half hours plus nowadays is because there are so many flags being thrown nowadays. Well, not just that, but also the fact that a lot more things are being reviewed and you have a lot more reviews, especially in college. Like I mentioned with the with the targeting calls, now all of those plays are getting reviewed. So you're getting that, you know, you're, you're getting those times, those timeouts as well. All right. So, uh, I just want to say real quick before we move on that I, I have a very intelligent discussion here. I didn't think that, that that question was going to be as popular as it was, and I'm glad that we had the conversation that we did about it. I really enjoyed this one. Yeah, All right, gentlemen, I think – a different perspective on a couple things. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this would be the time where we move on now, though, and I do believe it is time to tell our team of choice, get it together. Brandon? My team to get it together this week, I talked about them before, the New Orleans Saints. I mean, yes, Minnesota is a pretty good team, but you can't be having I, – I don't care about, you know, how you're playing on the field. You can't be having those kinds of, you know, really, you know, intense off-the-field uh controversies and and off the field uh interactions during a game like they had with ap and and sean Payne. uh you just like you said the the name of the segment is just that get together guys that's all eric get it together you you know I came in here with one team that I especially wanted to call out because I know they're just going to get bit in the butt late in the season. But I'm going to give them a little bit of reprieve because, Brandon, you've enlightened me. The Cincinnati Bengals. I mean, between the whole, the latest Bontez Perfect issue, which... How many games is suspended? It doesn't matter. And then you go and you literally lay an egg. You get shut out in your opener, and you're supposed to be the threat to Pittsburgh in the AFC North. <sighs> Cincinnati, Marvin Lewis, the whole crew, get it together. We... We kind of called this team out last week, and I feel the need to call them out again after their performance against the University of Texas at San Antonio Roadrunners. Baylor, get it together. Oh. <laughs> like, five years ago, they were a marquee college football team. They were constantly in discussions for being the best in the Big 12. They were hanging with the Oklahomas, the Oklahoma States, the K-States, the West Virginias. Even, I mean, up, up at this point, at this time, too, you had the Texas Techs of the world that were making making runs in the uh, in the Big 12. Baylor will be lucky to win a game in the Big 12 this year other than Kansas, and they might not even win that one at this rate. There, it wouldn't surprise me if Baylor loses to Duke. Yeah, there, there are two teams. Wait, hold on, hold on. Duke is not that bad of a team. Come on. <laughs> yeah, Duke put it on Northwestern last weekend. I'm just saying. They did manage to beat Miami controversial, uh, albeit, but they did. We don't, we don't talk about Miami that. Miami last don't year. Don't talk about that. Oh, no. All right. Anyways, back to back to my let, segment let, here. Let, let me back just, to my. OK, thank you. You can speak when I'm done here in a second, Brandon. Um. Seriously, how? How? First, you lose to FCS Liberty at home, and then you lose to University of Texas at San Antonio. You got beaten by the Roadrunner. Why we Coyote can't beat the Roadrunners? <laughs> Doesn't UTSA like have like one episode, uh, one upset, like a season? I actually I mean, think they went seven and six last year, but that is beside the point. <laughs> The fact of the matter is, is a Big 12 program like Baylor should not be losing to UTSA. Agreed. 
Yeah. I, I think that yeah. they brought in the wrong coach, but that's just me. Also, I would like to give an honorable mention to Steven's pick for this segment because he's unfortunately not able to be here with us. His get it together was Rutgers, who happened to lose to the Max Central Michigan this week. <laughs> well, well I mean, Rutgers. what do you expect? It's Rutgers. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Life is no fun in Piscataway, I'm guessing. No. I, and, I, no. and I'm loving it. Spoken. <laughs> Spoken like a true stormy there, Brandon. Stormy? Oh, wait, you're Seton Hall. Son yeah, of a no, bitch. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why I thought St. John's. John's. I don't know why I thought St. John's there. I'm, I'm special. All right, moving on. Sean, do you have anybody you want to tell Get It Together since you're hopping all over these segments? Hey, I'm just providing information that's needed, you know, so sometimes you forget <laughs> vital information. But, uh, you know. Such as Seton Hall. For example, in hey, fairness, that's... most of the rest of the, most of the rest of the collegiate world has forgotten about Seton Hall as well. Yes, unfortunately. Hey, we made the two straight NCAA and cha- NCAA tournament. So, uh, I'm a Kansas fan. Two's cute. Anyway, moving yes, on. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Sean, do you want to chime in with the team here? Or are you good? I'm good. I'm good. But I, right. I just want to say one thing about the Big 12. There are two teams that looked good. Now, the other one did win in a blowout, but it was against San Jose State. But there are two teams that looked like they were going to be decent this year that uh, both are need to be perennial get-together candidates for this year, and that's Texas and Baylor. Yeah, well, we'll see what Texas has this Saturday night when they go to the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. Yeah. Oh, the rematch. Although this one is going to be a whole lot uglier. <laughs> Woohoo! It's time to get aboard the lane train! <laughs> <laughs> I, oh. We, we, we need this sound effect. We gotta talk to Daniel and get this sound effect put together because frankly, a train horn with Lane Kiffin's voice in the background <laughs> would be money for this segment. Oh, yes. Agreed. <laughs> Florida Atlantic did not suck as bad as I thought they were going to this past weekend. Especially considering that they were traveling to Madison to play the Wisconsin Badgers. Wisconsin wins. Duh. <laughs> but the final score is only 31-14, excuse me, a 17-point differential, which is half of what I said they would lose by when I said that they were going to lose by at least five scores. Um, You know who they play next, Eric? Oh, God. Ugh. Bethune oh. Stuckman. <laughs> oh, well, that'll be a win. Yeah, I... Um, as a Miami fan, which I know why we schedule Bethune Cookman on a regular basis along with Florida A and M, I get it. But ugh. now with this one, it might be a win, but I gotta give some credit to Bethune Cookman. They might keep this interesting. I don't know how interesting, but. This is Florida Atlantic we're talking about, so, yeah. Bethune Cookman could at the very least scare them, if not straight out beat them. Yeah, let's not, let's be honest here. It's not like Lane Kiffin hasn't laid a couple of eggs in his day. <laughs> uh, a couple of eggs in a span of a month is more like it. <laughs> Brandon, your thoughts on Florida Atlantic versus Bethune Cookman? I I think Florida Atlantic will be able to win that game, but uh, it, it'll probably be closer than uh, most people would think. Florida Atlantic twenty four fourteen. I'll say twenty one fourteen. Ah, uh, twenty seven nineteen. And Florida Atlantic, you can't rely on another lightning delay. So there's that. <laughs> I still feel screwed that they didn't get blown out by by Wisconsin and Madison. Yeah, I that, feel that should have I, been my pick for uh, get it together and segue into uh, the lane train. <laughs> Disappointing. Get it together. Yeah, Bucky Badger, get it together. 
mom was by the way, my foot. <laughs> plus, plus, my what? dad's an alumni of Wisconsin, so. But by the way, what kind of mascot is an owl? While we're on the topic of Florida Atlantic, really, is that supposed? Uh, to imitate- Temple has an owl too. Yeah, same thing goes for Temple then. It's supposed to be something to do with wisdom, I think. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Oh, oh, wait, wait, whoa, 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 whoa! You just used the words wisdom and Florida Atlantic in the same conversation. Yeah, I also said I think and maybe. So there's a lot of words that I used right there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on now, context, people. <laughs> I, I just thought it would be funny to bust your stones about that one. <laughs> eh, touche. You, you, you got me on that one. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, I have one last question before we get ready to take it home for this week. You know what that question is? Are you serious? <laughs> Are you serious? All right, guys, it is college and football NFL upset time here. You guys gave – okay, not you, Eric, because you weren't on the show last week. But Sean, Brandon, and Steven all gave me all kinds of crap about Chicago over Atlanta. And damn if it didn't almost happen. (laughs) Yeah, that one was kind of sketchy near the end. Where did Mike Glennon learn how to play quarterback all of a sudden? I think Glennon's better than people were giving him credit for. He didn't have a ton of weapons when he was in Tampa Bay. There are actual, there. I mean, some weapons in Chicago, not a lot, but some. Uh, Jordan Howard comes to mind. True. Hey, we'll see. I got to give him a little bit of credit for that one. Minus the, you know, game-ending sack. That was a thing. And at least they're going the right decision of not having Mitch Trubisky starting this, the season this early and getting murdered, much like what happened to Deshaun Kaiser against Pittsburgh. Yeah, uh, uh, Cleveland doesn't really have much of a choice, though. Chicago does. I wouldn't call being within three points of winning being murdered. That that's. I would call getting. I would call getting yeah, I don't sacks. Care how many sacks times. you take, that doesn't mean anything. It's how you actually perform on the field besides the sacks. Oh no, when he wasn't when he actually had time to throw the football, Kaiser wasn't bad at all. I'm not knocking Deshaun Kaiser's performance Man, at if all. If you want to knock a rookie, but, knock Deshaun Watson. But hey. I I we'll find, out, we'll find out more about what Deshaun Watson can do this Thursday on NFL No, we won't, because I sure as hell won't be watching that snorefest. Anyway, moving on. Eric, college, are you serious? Now, before we came on air, I was right beside you with your pick. But I found something that is so sexy of an upset, even my computer turned off and couldn't handle it. (laughs) I think that's a sign that it is perfect. I will go from one sort of in-state rivalry to another. For all the stuff that we talk about with the Big 12, for all the stuff about a program that, while they had June Jones as coach, was very near and dear to my heart. Hawaii? No, after Hawaii. Although Hawaii, yes, they were too, but... I'm sorry. I'm at the point in my life to where I can't stay up until midnight to watch their games. It, sorry. Fair. This was a team that they have a documentary about them. Yes, they got oh, into a I know. little they bit of trouble that. about the 80s, but that was then, and this is, well, not then. I'm calling it. The Mustangs of Southern Methodist University come out of nowhere and nip the Horn Frogs of Texas Christian. You know what? I'm not going to lie. I actually gave that game a second look when I saw so it as well. Did I. So did mm-hmm. I. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, that... I'm seeing that, and I'm like, something about Kenny Hill and that TCU offense seemed a little extra vulnerable. These in-state stools, schools can get you. SMU is one of them. 
this is a TCU team coming off of scoring 60 points as well. So we'll see if they have anything left after their performance the week before. Brandon, are you I'm serious? Gonna go, I'm going to go with a game that it's not a ranked game, but it's still one that, you know, I, I could see them pulling off the upset, especially with them being at home. I'm going to go Cal over Ole Miss. Oh, Okay, I'm going to be the first one to do this in regards to a prediction here. Cal barely beat North Carolina, who is frankly awful. And should no. not have played and who should not have played Louisville as close as they did play Louisville. That was a bad performance by Louisville's defense. That's why I, I gotta, really said for Louisville's defense to get it together. So, I can't blame you there. <laughs> I'm I'm saying Old Miss goes out to Cal and trucks the Golden Bears. We'll mm. see on that one. Yeah, I, win. Yes, curve stomp. Different story. I don't know. I would say seventeen. I'm I'm gonna go thirty-eight twenty-one. Running Rebs. Hmm. I could I give Old Miss seven on that one. I would say closer to twenty eight twenty one. All right, so you're so you're you're laying seven then. I'm laying seventeen, and Brandon's calling for the outright upset. Yep. All right, my my are you serious is the one that Eric just teased. I was looking through the college football games, and honestly, originally there were a couple that stood out to me as possibilities when I was first looking down, but nothing that really stuck with me until I got to the bottom of the page on the ESPN schedule. And I saw that the Stanford Cardinal, who are coming off of getting shellacked by USC in a national broadcast on Fox last Saturday, are going to a very underrated San Diego State team to play the Aztecs. They're coming back with a second loss in a row. San Diego State wins outright 30-27. I I honestly have to agree with you with everything going on at San Diego and the fact that last year San Diego State was so close to edging out Wyoming and get into the Mountain West title game, I see them taking this one. If I'm not mistaken, didn't San Diego State beat Boise State last year as well? I believe so. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm almost certain they did. This is a San Diego State team to look out for. A lot of people here on the East Coast don't know anything about them because, you know, Mountain West, who has time for that over here on the East Coast, (laughs) and this game isn't starting until 10.30 p.m. Eastern. But to me, this is one to keep an eye on, and I honestly think that the Aztecs are going to pull off the upset over the Cardinal. I I could potentially see it. All right, Brandon, NFL time. Are you serious? My are you serious for the NFL is, and I think you'll like this one, Harry, Bills over Panthers. Uh, like it, I'm pi- I'm picking the same one. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, really? I mean, okay. Granted, the Panthers did beat what's going to be a terrible San Francisco team, but they barely beat the Jets. Barely, and it's the yes, Jets. But Buffalo's coming into this game a lot healthier than Carolina is. Mm, True, but I don't know. I don't see a team that the Jets can hang close with. I'm not going to say that we're going to go to Carolina and destroy them, but we are going to Carolina and we are going to win. I do want to point out that it's a divisional opponent, and that matters a lot. Look, you know how I feel about divisional opponents. You know how I felt about divisional opponents after Sunday. I don't care. <laughs> I'm just saying, there's been times where the Cowboys sucked balls, and the two times they lost was to the Redskins that year. I'm just, and the Redskins were awful. Divisional opponents, they know each other. 
you'll have blowouts like you saw in the Jacksonville Houston game. Well, you'll have really close games for absolutely no reason. It happens. <sighs> not hey. to mention the not to mention the Jets are petty. Well, at least their quarterback is. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was nice. <laughs> but um, cheesy but <laughs> It's cheesy, All right, bro. Air- Joke of the day, brought to you by Kraft. <laughs> <laughs> that okay, that's going to be. A, we're also going to have to come up with something for Oreo cookies to to sponsor as well, just to piss <laughs> off Stephen. <laughs> All right, Eric, are you serious? NFL. You know, you know, as much as we talked about the game being a snore fest, and I know I'm going to watch simply because we're going to be talking about the game on Football to the Max, and I want to see the continuation of the Color Rush uniforms. I think Cincinnati finds some sort of miracle or some sort of potentially legal substance that they could somehow consume to get it together and well I'm not sure if it would be considered an upset it would be in my eyes given the performances based on ESPN they are the favorites right now yeah but I mean by what sort of margin are we talking wide favorites Minus six. Oh, dear Lord. Who was smoking what? And where can I get some? <laughs> I, I mean, it. Yeah, three. Let's put this, yeah, I can understand. But. Let's put that minus six into perspective here. That meant if this game was played on a neutral field, Cincinnati would be a two and a half point favorite. Mm, true. Which I completely that, disagree with. I think Cincinnati beating Houston is an upset. So do I. I mean... Even with uh, Deshaun Watson, who looked half decent in that opener, Savage didn't. And I will say, Jacksonville Jaguars fans, I love you. I'm with you. Do all as much as I possibly can. But I am going to use this expression that I have not used often. And pardon my French, but... For the city of Jacksonville, calm your tits, okay? One game, this is it. I've lived through many a terrible season that start out this way. Don't get your hopes up now. But that said, Cincinnati, if they want to prove themselves on national TV, show that last week was a fluke. I think they do. I think they beat Houston. Narrowly... I'm smelling like maybe a 16-13 here, but the Bengals get off the schneid. I would just like to state for the record that when it comes to overall scoring this season, the Los Angeles Rams defense has 12, Cincinnati has zero. Yeah, that's why I say that this is an upset. Again, divisional opponent, by the way, but... You know, these two teams have a lot of history. Play, you know, let's not forget playoffs games. Playoffs? Where playoffs. Where the Bengals couldn't win. Playoffs? playoffs? So, They're just trying to win a game here. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, Bengals winning would not uh, would not surprise me, honestly. I, I still think you got to worry about that Houston offensive line being awful. All right, Sean, since you I just don't see Houston going 0-2. All right, Sean, since you're chiming in here, you might as well give us one as well. Hey, Sean Garmer, are you serious? Oh, Lord, I don't pay attention put- to who's an upset or whatever. I <laughs> put- watch all these the games, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I'm putting you on the spot anyway. <laughs> well, you're going to have to wait for me to pull up the damn schedule. Cause I haven't looked at it yet. Smooth. Uh, um, I, you know... This is uh, it's. I don't know that you. There's a lot of here that I just go. Oh yeah, this is such an upset. Because, uh, but. All right. Yeah, well, while Sean's looking over, while Sean's looking over the schedule and possibly stalling for time, I'm going to give another game to keep an eye on for everybody here. We talked about Kansas City possibly being the new favorite in the AFC. 
I, I think they're going to be a little bit big headed about what happened against New England. And I think they're going to pay for it because I think Philadelphia is going to go into Arrowhead this Sunday and beat them. Mm. Now that's going to Arrowhead. Are you serious? Yeah, really. Are you serious right there? Ah. Hmm. No. I I figured I'd give you guys one more to talk about before we got out of here. I I mean, yeah. I got to use Sean's point when you're talking about divisional games and how they did against Washington. As much as I love to get every single opportunity to make fun of Kirk Cousins, every single chance I get. He sort of likes that. I don't like that. I don't. Take your franchise tag and damn it, live with it. The team does not have faith in you for a reason. Look at what you did. Look at what you're making me do right now. <laughs> oh my god! god Tell you question myself. Yeah, I mean, that's that's like what Sean said, and not to mention the NFC East has some of the fiercest rivalries. Actually, I don't know. You look at that; those two teams, though. That offense did not look good. The Eagles' defense looked pretty good. This is why I'm saying the Rams at home, they're going to make Washington go 0-2. Now that one I could see. Because I also see it the other way. I think that'll be a close game. Yeah, I don't think that the Rams over Washington's really a surprise. And by the way, Daniel Snyder changed the racist team name. They're not, and I don't think even the Indians at this point really care. They <laughs> so, don't. As much as I would love to see the Washington Bravehearts, it remains a pipe dream. Come on. The, I just said the Cleveland Indians are out there breaking records right now. I mean, come on. <laughs> like, they don't In- care about that stuff anymore. It's not going to happen. Indians is, Indians is respectful to the heritage. Braves is respectful to the heritage. Redskins was a racial slur. It needs changed. Well, then, okay, the? well, then, why did uh, North Dakota have to change theirs from the Fighting Sioux? Well, that's um, the NCAA, that's a completely different... Yeah, that's a different deal. <laughs> my my suggestion to that would be because they were being sued. <laughs> Man. <laughs> that one. But, I mean, the question with that... Another is, cheesy joke change? of the day brought to you by Kraft. <laughs> no, we're going to get sued ourselves for mentioning brands that we don't have sponsorships with, but that's okay. Yeah, well, we're Whoa. not claiming we're not claiming they're actually paying us. We're just uh-huh. mentioning their names. Sean, look, you know how I am with Hostess. You know how I am with Night Owl Cookies. Damn it, I'm going to keep throwing stuff against the wall and something is going to stick, okay? <laughs> Oh, now, if anybody would kindly help me on my quest on Twitter, that would be much appreciated. <laughs> um, the thing that's going to stick, ironically enough, the cheese. <laughs> uh, God. Gentlemen, do we have any final words to say before we get out of here? Uh, just my, my Homer rant for the day. Giants, get it together. I know Odell Beckham was I'm injured. shocked they weren't your pick for Get It Together. I am shocked. Well, because, I mean, they they had... I, I'm not going to use it as an excuse, but Odell Beckham being out didn't help at one bit. But okay. Okay. Od- I, Odell Beckham being out was not a 16-point difference, though. You guys laid an egg against Dallas. Oh, and I agree. Marshall just disappearing. I, I agree. I agree. But I think part of the reason for why Brandon Marshall disappeared is because he was the sole sole focus of the Cowboys' defense. So, well, that actually brings up another thought to me. Uh, Sean, why can't Orlando Scandrick stay healthy? No idea, but a fractured hand is not a big deal. He might play on Sunday. But I would have to agree with – I would have to agree with, um, I forget who said it right now, but uh, one of the Giants defensive guys said that they should trade one of their defensive guys for some O-line help, which I would definitely agree with. Um, So they need to get that offense together, um, or this is going to be a long, long season. 
Eric, would you like to home a rant about your Jaguars? Yes, you got a big win. I still don't know how it happened. Where Dexter Fowler all of a sudden decided to show up from. Although, all respect to Calais Campbell, we got you here from Arizona. I don't know how, I don't know who did what or who said what to whom to make that happen. But you're making us look damn good. But seriously, this... You're playing so far to make sure that you keep Doug Marone. And even then, he could do what he did to Buffalo and still decide to bail. So just... Yeah, screw that guy. (laughs) Everybody, take a deep breath. If we're at least have a winning record by week five, okay. That's something that you can get behind. But this, no. Just no. Well, take a breath. You're you're falling to one and one this week. Exactly. Uh, Home against Baltimore at the Jets at the Steelers. Yeah, two and three most likely. No. Mm -hmm. See? That would completely validate my point. And if the Jets beat us, God help us all. <laughs> I, I don't think that's a guarantee that the Jags are losing to the Titans this week, but that's just me. Uh, I, I'm picking Tennessee in that game. I just think Tennessee has too many weapons for Jacksonville. Yeah, I think Tennessee, but it'll be a close game. Look, we histor- we've historically crapped the bet against Tennessee. If look at the 99 season. That's all I'm saying. I don't wish to discuss the 1999 season in Tennessee in the same sentence. Thank you. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> you and I can completely agree on that one. Sean, would you like to, would you like to home a rant about your Cowboys, or are you good here? I, I would just say as happy as I am, the defense played better than expected. I think we need to cool the Jets on it. Uh, huh. Just let's – Let's see how they do against two very capable receivers in Denver, and let's see how they do further on beyond that. You know, again, divisional game. You're really hyped for this game because the Giants beat you twice last year. I think everybody wanted to prove that they could, you know, beat this team. Let's see when you get out of that bubble and how they do. Um, The other thing, too, is I think Denver's defense is significantly better than the Giants' defense is. I don't know about that. But I'm not sure about see. that. I, yeah. I'm telling you right now that the Denver defense was st- statistically the second best in the NFL last year. That may be so. the case. Different deal, though. Behind Minnesota. My homer rant is going to be simply to repeat the same words I, re- I said earlier in the show. The AFC East leading Buffalo Bills. Yes, Not it was the Jets. Yes, we play Carolina this weekend, and frankly, that game does scare me. Because if Cam Newton all of a sudden decides to play like the Cam Newton of four years ago, we're screwed. Yes, the Patriots shocked the world and lost to the Chiefs. Hey, we're going to take it any way we can get it, Brandon, because it's not going to last for long. <laughs> oh, I <Nope>. know that. <laughs> Um, uh, it, it is, as I said in our preview episode for Buffalo, if we can finish 8-8 eight and eight this year, I'm happy, especially with rebuilding our staff with a new head coach and a new offensive and defensive coordinator. Sean McDermott got us a win against the Jets, which is something that Rex Ryan failed to deliver more often than he actually delivered. So a step in the right direction under the McDermott era in Buffalo. He, and he, plus, he, couldn't beat, he couldn't win with the Jets, and he couldn't beat the Jets. And not to mention, there is also the story that came out on Uproxx about Buffalo still having the most fun stadium in the NFL. I'll let you guys finish <laughs> up on your own. We won't go into details here on the kickoff. Uh, if anybody tunes into my next episode of Point of Viewer, I might give that a mention. Also, a very funny story about Saran Wrap. <laughs> well, you have that to look forward to. Hey, Sean, where can they find you? W2M Sean on Twitter. You can listen to Eric and I Thursday nights and Monday nights on Football to the Max if you want to hear more of our football ramblings here on the W2M Network. 
And Sean's dog also promises to try to make an appearance as well. <laughs> yes, he does. Brandon, Brandon, where can they find you? Uh, on uh, Twitter at Bisco underscore Gotham SN. Any other podcasts to look for you on? Uh, not right now. All right. Eric just mentioned Point of Viewer and Football to the Max. You can find me here on the kickoff as well as Sunday nights with Patrick Ketza on Wrestling Unwrapped. And myself and Sean traditionally do the SmackDown and 205 Live reviews here on the W2M Network. Sean should be back in the saddle next Tuesday for those. So for the executive producer, Sean Garmer, the traditional co-host, Brandon Biscabing, and our fill-in co-host this weekend, normal producer Eric Watkins, I'm Harry Broadhurst. You have been listening to The Kickoff here on the W2M Network, www.w2mnet.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll catch you next week. The following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit w2mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment.